guys, this is Elite Ferrix again. This is the third video in my tutorial series on how to make 8-bit music. So today, as the video says, we are going to be talking about percussion. So that is all of the different drum sounds of sorts that we have in our songs, our kicks, our claps, our cymbals, our hats, and our tom drums, things like those, and how we, we make those. Uh, using 8-bit synths. So I'm going to start off today using the same song that we used in the last video, uh, Adventurarius. And so we're going to look first at some of the percussion sounds that are used in this track, and then we'll move on to a different track that is actually on the same album as Adventurarius called Outlaw, the Pixel Outlaw, excuse me. So we're going to look at those. So first let's take a look at what we've got here. Some of what you'll see here was actually discussed in the basics tutorial video, but first let's take a look at percussion. So why not? Let's make a couple of kick channels from scratch. So I'm going to insert a brand new Magical 8-bit plugin channel. So here we are. All the settings are set to default. And for starters, I'm going to open up what I usually do to start off my kick sound, which is to select a triangle. And in order to do this, we're going to need to adjust a couple of the other modulation knobs here. The first of which is the sweep switch, which if you remember, changes whether uh, the note that we play rises or falls. So here is one of our notes with the sweep switch off. Let me turn the volume down to make sure I don't deafen anybody. Here is what it sounds like normally. You'll notice just a flat note. Now, if we put this to positive, so that makes our note bend upward, and negative, which is what we will be using, makes it move the other direction. However, in order to make this effective for what we need, because you'll notice this sounds nothing like a kick. Not very much. But what we're going to do is adjust down our sweep time. We're going to make it very, very short. So now I've cut the sweep time in half. And that makes the note bend downward, if you will, faster uh, by reducing the amount of time it takes to go through the stages of the sweep. And if we continue to make this very, very short, we're now at 10% of the original length. You notice now we start getting a little closer. Now we're getting somewhere, all right? So if we bring it down just a little further, let's say to about a 35, now if you listen to it, now we've got kind of that thud thud that we're really looking for for a kick sound. Um, for reference, the note that I am playing here is a C5 on the piano roll, so right in the middle. And I do that for a couple of different reasons, because it gives you a lot of room to move up or down if for whatever reason you wanted to, and it just happens to be a good starting point that sounds good in most songs that I've done. So again, you can see here, we are hitting the C5 key. All right, so there is that. Now, this by itself does have some sound to it. Let me turn off these other two channels. I will solo this one here. And I'm going to pull up the piano roll and let's drop some notes on here. So like I said, I've been hitting C5, so I'm gonna start off putting in some longer notes there and you can actually hear what they sound like. So that's the first part. Now, what's important to note here is that the length of the note will make a difference in the way that the kick sounds. So if I drag these notes out longer, um, you'll notice at the end you hear more of the kind of you at the very end that you will kind of stick around. It sounds kind of like a at the very end. But if we shorten these up, you won't hear as much of that which makes a much more crisp sound. And if we bring these even shorter, you'll notice we get a very uh, distinct sound. All right, so it's up to you as to which, uh, what length of note you actually use. It's up to preference. Uh, also, adjusting the volume of the notes will be important. So if you take a look at what I've done on the existing kick channels, I will remove this one now. Here are the kick channels that are actually used in this song. So here is my triangle kick, and you'll actually notice my settings are almost identical to what we just made. So this is my triangle kick. The sweep time is again about a 0.035. So if we go listen to what it sounds like, 
we hear it sounds very similar to what we just heard. Now I have reduced the volume on these notes a little bit because when I make a kick in an 8-bit song, I usually pair together a triangle and a square with the exact same settings on the sweep time so that they match up perfectly. And the reason for that is because that makes the triangle wave stack with the square wave and actually makes it sound a little bit different. So if I play just the triangle first, and then just the square separately, neither one of them sounds perfect. I think the triangle sounds a little better, but together we get a stronger kick that stands out above the other notes as well. And so that's the first trick I, I use. Now I will not always use triangle and square together, but if I have to pick one or the other, I will almost always pick the triangle because it keeps a little bit truer to what you might consider a traditional kick sound for a song. So there is that. Um, now, let's move on from just these and talk about some of the other aspects. I, I really briefly though, again, I did mention the lengthening of the notes, changing the way they sound. Um, with these square notes added in here, you will be able to hear much more clearly the difference between the length of the notes as they play. My gripe in this section with leaving these notes too long is that it makes them sound uh, kind of messy because it leaves that that sort of dragging on at the end that low just kind of sound that makes it sound as though you don't really know what you're doing but this is very crisp very clean So there's the first section. So those are our kicks, and really, that's more or less all there is to it. If you want to adjust the sounds just slightly, you can adjust the sweep time here, up or down, to slightly variate it. But again, like I said, I, I make the triangle and the square have the exact same settings. So the easy way to do that would be to set up one channel first. I usually start with the triangle. And then instead of trying to drag this slider here to make the time exactly the same, uh, I will simply duplicate the channel. So just right click on it and click clone. And that will actually make another triangle channel, at which point all I do is change the triangle to a square and voila, now I have them with the same settings but different instruments. So that is for the kicks. So I will leave those there for now, but there is one other plugin I want to show you that I use in this and some other tracks, and that is this plugin here which is N-E-S-V-S-T. Um, I have not used it in its full capacity, I will fully admit, but what I do use it for is it has built-in four percussion sounds. It has here a built-in DPCM kit. So we can use that to recreate some other sounds that you've heard, more like those you might have heard in Contra games on the NES or any other games that made were made by Konami. So you can hear we have different sounds, kind of a kick here, and then sort of a snare sound, a clap, and kind of another sort of a snare sort of sound. And those are the four that it comes prepared with to use. You can, I believe, actually put in your own sound waves here and it will reprocess them to sound more like an 8-bit instrument. But I won't go too much into detail for that for this video, perhaps in a future video. But what I do is I usually use this to beef up my kicks a little bit, as you'll hear. So the two of those together make a better kick sound. So if I actually play the track itself here using just the kicks, and then add this in, you'll hear a little bit of a difference. Again, just slowly kind of filling in that low end of the sound spectrum so that our 8-bit music sounds as full as possible. But more importantly than this is the other instruments that are ready to play here. And those are our noise channels. So I have two different noise channels on here. So let's take a look at each of those. The first one I call noise perk S, so noise percussion S for short. And what I mean by short is if you look here, here is the decay channel, which has been brought down to a very low level, as has the sustain. So again, just to refresh your memory, the decay is the amount of time it takes for the note to change from full volume when you first hit the key 
to reach the sustain level over here. So our note starts off at 100% volume and then falls in 0.25 seconds to 5% volume. So it goes down very, very low, very quickly, which sounds like this. But that's if we hold the note out, because again, since we keep a sustain level, if we keep the key depressed, you will continue to hear the note. So because our sustain level is there, you do continue to hear the note playing, because I have not released yet. Sorry for the noise. Now, if I change these, it will adjust the sound. So if I increase the decay time, let's say I'll kick it up about three ticks here, you'll notice it will take it much longer to get quieter. I'll, I'll again reduce the volume here just to kind of keep your ears safe. It takes much longer, whereas if I bring it back down again, it goes instead of a much quicker, which again helps emulate true percussion sound. So when it comes to the percussion, particularly with a noise channel, it is extremely important to really familiarize yourself with the decay knob and the sustain knob here and determine exactly what it is that you want to do. So there is our short one. Now let's look at that as comparison to the, the long channel. So if you look here, our short channel, our decay time is 0.25 seconds and a sustain level of 0.05. So quarter of a second of decay, whereas the long channel, this is 0.07. So this one actually decays quicker than the other channel. The reason I call it a long noise channel is because I use this channel to make longer percussion sounds like a cymbal or a clap instead of just a quick hat hit like a I use this for a more sustained sound kind of like a and the way we do that is by making this decay come in very quickly and having a very low sustain, it allows us to have a note that we hear it start quickly, but then falls to a quicker level. So kind of listen to the difference here. These are very short notes. So we'll listen to just those first. Very quick, very short notes. So just hear a Whereas the long ones, we have longer notes and different settings on the channel. You'll notice this will sound, of course, much different. So this has kind of like a low clap or sort of a snare sound to it. So we put these together with our other percussion instruments, and all of them will combine to give us the basics of our percussion at the beginning of the song. So let's take a listen to all of the drums together. Now that's of course a very, very simple percussion line, but we start to spice things up as we move on. So before I get into this next set of details here, the most important thing about percussion in an 8-bit track is making sure that it evolves over time as the song changes, because the one thing you absolutely do not want is for the listener to get bored. And it's not to say that 8-bit music is boring, but most people who listen to music listen to music with lyrics. And lyrics really draw the listener's attention. Because in our 8-bit music we don't have lyrics, all we have is the instruments, we have to be ready to keep the song changing, keep it interesting, so that our listener won't get bored. So I'll play the first section of the song here, and you'll hear the percussion change once it reaches this section here you'll hear a change in the percussion, so pay attention to that once it reaches there. So there is our change. We go from this very basic percussion pattern at the beginning And then we spice it up by adding in on our percussion here, this NESVST plugin, this sound. Very quiet, but still enough to just barely round out the sound. And on our long percussion channel, now we add in a cymbal-esque sound to help balance it out, which is just this kind of 
up here. So again, if you listen to the difference with it without or with these notes versus without them, now we've brought the percussion speed up a little bit. It feels like there's more going on. And at the same time, the melody of the song is now beginning to pick up. So our percussion evolves with it. You want to keep things changing, keep them new to keep your listener interested. And it's more fun for you, too, as you compose. So there's that. Now, the percussion does pick up a little bit. Like I said, we make those two changes there. And then here, in our other pattern, we add in a little bit more flavor. So we go from here. And then we start adding in other little bits of flair. And again, here we have a different example. So listening to just the percussion, if we mute out these other tracks, you can hear just the changes in the percussion as we go through. So we've got that just the tiny change in the melody, so we've got the... So very simple changes as we move on. Now, what we've done there with the percussion is we've just added in a little bit of extra notation there, a little bit of extra notes. So let's take a look. We've just, instead of having just these claps, we added another one here. So what you're actually hearing is only this here. This is the only change that we hear. Oh, sorry, here we go. So really, it's just this note and this one over here. So again, if I mute these other notes up here, you can hear. And that's the only thing that's changed since this previous pattern. Here's the one we started with. Here's the next one. And then the other one that changes. So, and that's, that's it. That is really the majority of the change in percussion for this entire song. You don't have to change it a lot, just enough so that it isn't entirely stagnant as things go on. So that's the basic part of it. Um, once the song gets to about halfway through, we do have another change in the percussion, and that's the addition of this pattern here. Now, this is going to look awful when you first see it, but I promise it's not that bad. So here is what we've done. We've added in these other notes here as a difference. And if you look closely, you'll notice these are actually down here off the beat. They're actually spaced out a little bit differently. And so at first glance, you're like, wait, is that a mistake? You know, why would you do that? And the answer is because it has an interesting effect when it combines together with the other percussion tracks that already exist. So if we play just this track, number seven, by itself, you'll hear it sounds strange on its own. But then if I put it together with the other tracks in the percussion, you will hear the difference. So let me activate just these percussion channels here. And I'll turn these ones on too. I'll do it just, and I'll also turn on the bass so that you can actually hear that as well. It will make more sense when I explain about the changes that we've done. Okay, so here is where we started off. And here comes. So we made one change, and that was the addition of these notes. So I'll disable the bass channels now. Oops, that's not what I meant to do. Here we go. I will disable the bass channels, and you can hear just the percussion. And you will hear these notes when they stack together with the others and the difference it makes. Now, instead of just this slower, 
just you know very kind of casual we add this in and now it speeds up significantly because now we've gone from sort of a slower just kind of a so now all of a sudden it's and it goes much faster. And so what that does is at this point, the melody of the song is also picking up. So again, the percussion mirrors the change in the energy level of the track. So that's all that's pretty much been done in this track here. The only other thing I will bring up is in these sort of patterns you see sort of floating on their own down here is this is just a way kind of creating sort of a little break before the percussion returns back to its normal pattern. And this is again to keep things changing up in the song. Particularly in this area here where you'll notice the kick pattern, just you know what we started with drops out to show that we're building up energy before we have kind of like a little drop here. All we've done here is just kept this section at the end of the pattern. To keep, it's kind of like a tom drum roll going down where it's just like before we kind of hit the cymbal and keep going, you know. So that's sort of the purpose for that there. For this particular track, that is more or less all there is to the percussion. Um, but I will talk a little bit about the different noise notes that I've used and what we're trying to emulate by doing them. Now, we've already talked about the kicks, the triangle, and the square, but let's talk about the noise channel because that is really where the majority of the magic of the percussion in your 8-bit song comes in. So, let's take a look. Um, I'll start off with the basic pattern here, uh, ignoring this PCM channel now and going strictly for the noise synths. So here, the basic rule for the noise channel is the higher the notes you go on the piano roll up in this section. Oh, uh, let me reduce the volume again so I don't destroy your ears. Um, the basic rule of the noise percussion is that the higher up you go, the closer you are to sounding like hi-hats and cymbals. The mid-range, you're looking at more like snares or a quick hat just to kind of keep the melody going and then the low range you're looking at like you know building sounds or kind of a kick almost so what we have here is roughly mid-range and very short notes so this is imitating kind of like a simple hi-hat sound so we've got these two different instruments here on this noise channel this long noise channel and up here at the top let me zoom this out a little so we can see them both. So these longer ones up here, oh, that's a little too much. So these are all the way up here in the E7 range. Um, and so these are kind of like a cymbal, kind of a tss, tss sort of sound. And then way down here, this is kind of like a clap sound, sort of. So again, kind of like sort of similar. Uh, again, it's up to you. You can kind of determine the exact way you do the percussion on your own, but those are generally what I go for and sort of what I've used based on sounds that I've heard in Mega Man songs and things like that. So again, just as a basic general rule, higher notes, you're looking at things that sound more like cymbals, uh, kind of high or mid-range, you're looking at hats, and then down toward the lower end, you're looking at things like claps and snares. So those are all things to kind of keep in mind as you work towards making your own percussion. Now, the percussion in this track is fairly simple, so I wanted to kind of go through this first, but as I said, there's another track I want to go into, and that's this other track called uh, Pixel Outlaw from the same album. And in this track, the percussion really is what drives this whole song together. So I will let the track play a little bit on its own, and then we'll go back and talk about the individual instruments uh, that we have to use here. So here we go.
So there's our basic percussion layout. We start off with some percussion that is entirely made in a single noise channel. So you'll notice our notes are, they look awful, they're all over the place here. Um, but that's because each one is actually imitating different parts of the percussion. So here, these long notes on the C2 sound like this. Up here we have these other ones. So really, with these notes here, what we have, if you listen, I'll make a spare channel here, just so you can hear those notes play by themselves. This is actually still a very simple percussion melody. So not too complicated. And you notice these lower notes are at a lower volume as well, if you check their velocity down there on the bottom. And that's so that these upper ones are really those that stand out. So instead of it's And again, we've adjusted the length of these notes uh, specifically to make them sound how we want. Because if we adjust them and make them longer or shorter, again, it will change how they sound. Here are those notes at full length, and you notice it does not have the same sound. It actually sounds kind of like a ducktails there a little bit the, the way. But if we shorten them even below where they were, it changes the sound even more which to me is a little too short, just a little bit. So anyway, that's what we've got with the beginning part of that note section. So now I will clear these out. We'll go back to our other channel here. And now we've got all these other little notes all over the place. So again, I will play just this noise track by itself so you can hear exactly what it is that I've put together. But again, remember, the bass was just that And all these other notes are really just to fill in that space. So if I take these out, you'll actually hear all the other small notes that are there. So now that by itself sounds completely disconnected. Um, but it's all of those together that makes the sound really go that what you know, go the way that we're looking for. So we've got kind of a complex melody together that's like Now, before this was actually finished, this was 100% experimentation. Um, I had never used the noise channel to make this many different sounds at once before, and I just started out with the very basic melody that we started off with here in the middle, which actually sounds very similar to what you hear in Mega Man 2's Woodman song, another percussion element of which we're going to hear in just a minute. But so that's the main part of the melody for this whole track. You'll notice it repeats again later on, the only change is that we've added in these little notes up here, these little hat sounds. You've got to keep things going, just... And of course, we've still got my percussion in here. Uh, the kicks. Now you notice for this one, they're both called square kicks, but they, as it is again, a square and a triangle. And again, they have the same sweep time. They both have 0.023 this time because we've got a little bit faster BPM and these uh, ones are a little bit longer note. So again, it's just fine adjustments based on what you like the sound of when you're actually composing the track. Now that we've got those together, uh, the kicks and the noise channel, there's one other thing I want to talk about and that's this pattern here where I called it tri beats. So if we listen to this, this will should be something that sounds very familiar from a lot of Mega Man music. <laughs> Again, actually sounds very similar to that Woodman a song I talked about before. So what we've done to do that is we have a triangle, we still have a negative switch on the sweep, and our sweep time is there. So actually, we've almost recreated just the kick drum sound that we've used before, but this time instead, we've started with notes that are higher up here. 
this section, they, these are the same C5 as the kick channel, but these ones are higher up. And because the sweep time is a little longer than it is on these kick channels, this is a 0.02, whereas the tri beats is a 0.08, meaning it takes it four times as long. The speed at which it moves downward is four times slower, if you will. Um, gives us this other kind of but it's not a kick drum it sounds almost more like a secondary bass line and so we put those together with everything else and that's what gives us this interesting combination So there's all of it together. So in this track, that's the percussion that we have, the rhythm that keeps it going. But partway through this song, we make an, a very different change to the percussion. And that's right around here. So listen and you'll hear the change clearly. <laughs> So at this section in the song, we've changed the rhythm entirely. We've kept the same sort of energy level, but instead of this, you know, kind of funky sort of direct sound, now we've changed to this relaxed kind of offbeat sound where with the kicks, instead of being entirely on each on beat, like this, most of these now are on the off beat instead. And so that gives us a different sound where the emphasis changes from the kicks one at a time and instead moves to the other instruments. So listen to this channel on its own now and you'll hear the difference there. So the idea there is to, again, because the melody of the song is changing, the percussion changes with it. And let me turn on these so you can kind of hear the change in the melody, too. Now notice up here, these uh, other percussion channels come back in partway to sort of fill in the gap. Start us down the path to returning to the original percussion pattern that we started with from the one we've already got to kind of go f and start to include the old back with the new. So there is that part of it. Now, once we get beyond this section, we return to the original pattern up here, only this time we have increased the speed by taking this pattern and these ones that are on every beat and doubling them up, which makes it sound much faster. If you look in, they look a little different from farther away, but close up you'll notice they're all the same length and they're all the same volume. So again, the melody is picking up in its energy and such, and so we have the percussion change to sort of match that energy level, if you will.
then everything starts back over again. So I know there's a lot going on in this track and it can be a lot to get used to. I know this may look a little complicated to begin with, but once you start experimenting with the sounds and really getting used to the placement of the notes, you'll find it's actually not as bad as you might think, and that with just a little bit of practice, you will find yourself growing more comfortable very quickly. I, I, I felt that way when I uh, first really began delving into this stuff, and, and I hope it will be the same for you, and of course that you know things like these tutorials will actually help you. Um, there is one very last thing I will mention before I end this video, and that is what I've been doing with these patterns here and these channels that I call noise build and noise fade. And so that is just this part here. And then the other one. So again, I use that just to sort of build and drop energy almost like you would in a an electronica song where you have, you know, kind of the build up. And then once you get to the top, the as it gets to the end. So again, here's the, as with the song as a whole. Again, just a way to sort of carry the energy over as it keeps going. So anyway, the way we do that is uh, by using a noise channel with a positive switch first and giving it a sweep time uh, that you can adjust. You will actually have to adjust the sweep time uh, to match you the, the tempo of your track. Um, and so it'll change depending on where you put it, how you have it start and everything. You can just adjust it and listen to hear when it gets to a level that's about where you want. Um, and then on the fade, you do the opposite, a negative switch, and you can change your sweep time to make it close or however you feel is best. Now you'll notice on this fade, I've added in some decay here so that it won't stay at maximum volume the entire time that the note is played. And so I've decreased the sustain level to match. Um, that's because since this is supposed to be kind of a crash, it's not supposed to stay loud. You know, when a crash goes, it's not a and then just suddenly cuts off. It's supposed to be a crash. It starts off It starts off loud, but then it quiets down, so it's supposed to be <sighs> which is what we do using the decay and the sustain level there. So again, just one more time. Just I'll turn on just the bass and the percussion tracks here so you can hear them in action. So again, pay real close attention to how the first build goes and goes from maximum volume and stays there, it ends immediately because we then instantly pick up with the fade noise channel and use it to go from that maximum volume and then quiet it down and disappear. So pay attention to that as you hear. You'll hear again this part building up and then fading out. And so that's just about smoothness of overall audio level and transitioning cleanly. Anyway, um, I will probably end this video here um, in talking about the uh, percussion sections. Um, hopefully you found this video informative, and hopefully I've answered more curiosity and answered questions more than I have raised questions. Um, but if there is something else you would like to know, um, please feel free to ask any questions in the comments here on the video. Um, and let me know your thoughts. Um, from here, I have a couple of different ideas of what I would like to do with uh, this tutorial series. So if there is something you would like to see in an upcoming video, please feel free to leave a comment or to contact me. Um, I will leave some contact info for me, such as my email and perhaps my Discord in the uh, description of the video below. So uh, let me know the kinds of things you would like to see. And in the meantime, I hope this video has been informative for you and will help you in your music. Thanks a bunch for watching and bye for now.